out this morning, and uh, we're going to get into James in chapter uh, James in chapter five. We've already uh, read them, so I want to get into the, a message this morning in your series. It'll be a two part one, the final sermon. Uh, of, of its kind, the final sermon of uh, the series, which is pure work, but it will be this week and next week. And uh, so open your Bibles to James in chapter 5 as we begin to look at a pure work today, a pure work, again, the final series or final sermon in this series. And James 5, and just look at verse 7 and 8 real quick, and they're only springboard text. We're going to land in John 14 today, and uh, that's where we'll be for the rest of the morning. But the Bible says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Now, beloved, we live in a world today, a time today, To where we are waiting for the precious day of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to return in the air. It's something that is spoken about. Uh, I know as long as as I have been preaching, nine to 30 years now, uh, that that it's been something that's on the forefront. It's been on the tip of the tongue. It's in just about every sermon somewhere in the world uh, on a given Sunday and or Wednesday or whenever people meet to to worship in the Lord uh, Jesus Christ at their uh, local call out assembly of believers in Jesus Christ. And uh, it is something that should be on the forefront of our life and our thoughts continually all the time. Not just in our day today in 2024, but in Paul's day, even nearly 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul uh, expected the return of Jesus Christ in the air. And he expected, it's called the intimacy of Christ. We are looking for that, but beloved, we must apply patience in our life and his return in the air. And while we're here, while we're on this earth, my friend, If we don't apply those patients, we will not have a pure work that we need to perform. The reason we are left here. We have to think of this sometimes just under a simple common sense. If you'll just think about it in your heart and in your mind, just just a common sense thought today. Why on earth are we still here? Why, Why not just take us home? Why not just take us out of here the moment we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? Because there's a work for us to do. And our work, just as our worship, just as our wisdom, just as our our words, it should be pure. It should be pure. And I want to submit that thought to you today as a body of believers that we are to perform on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ a pure work. Now let's open our Bibles back up now and we're going to go to the book of John. John in chapter 14 and, and we'll just ask you to stay there for the rest of the morning as we begin to break down some of these verses here. And we're going to start looking in John 14, looking in verse 4 through 7, by way of a a brief introduction today into this pure work. In verse 4, the Bible says, And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me, or no man cometh unto the Father, but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Now Jesus, of course, is speaking to his disciples at this present time. The ones he refers to knowing the way. And have you ever just sat back and thought, about the way, the, very, the way that Jesus Christ is speaking of today. Have you ever just stopped and thought about it for just a second, beloved? It was Jesus Christ who was sent to bring this way unto mankind. His creation was, uh, was placed here for his fellowship, for his glory. And this way is the way to eternal life. And yes, there is only one way. Amen. Jesus Christ said, I am the way. He didn't say a way. He said, I am the truth. He didn't say a truth. He said that that it's the the only way that you're going to get to the Father, the only way that you can be reconciled unto the Father, the only way that you're going to have eternal life is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Any gospel which adds anything whatsoever to be saved by grace through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is a false gospel and should be considered as such. I don't care if if they want to include baptism, church membership, what you give, flagellation, all the things that 
that these perverted so-called churches in the world today want to bring in a, a new book. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Brother Dad mentioned in opening prayer today about thank God we're not in a Mormon organization. Praise the Lord for that, that we're not uh, reading a book written by a pervert, amen, written by a, a whoremonger, if you will, an adulterer, if you will, the Book of Mormon. you got to be kidding me. Praise God that we don't believe that, that Jesus and Satan were brothers. Amen. Praise God we have the truth. Praise God that we're not told that we all came from some planet in the outer space and we're just dropped down here to experience life on this earth. That's the kind of nonsense they believe. Amen. Now they'll knock your door. They'll talk to you about the King James Bible. Matter of fact, they'll knock your door and give you a free King James Bible. But then they're going to pervert that scripture. Salvation is nothing else but through Jesus Christ and the work that he performed and only he could perform. Proverbs in chapter 16 tells us in verse 25, that There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The old poem says, Once my heart was black as sin. Until the Savior came in. His precious blood, I know, has washed it whiter than snow. And in this world, I am told, I'll walk the streets of gold. Oh, wonderful, wonderful day, he washed my sins away. Praise the Lord. That point is based on Isaiah 53, to where though our sins be as scarlet, he will make them like snow. One could never imagine, my friend, the beauty of the free gift of salvation. But with this gift, like any other gift on the planet today, it must be received. It must be received. Look back in the book of John there. Go all the way up to the, the first verse, the opening verse of John 14. And notice what the Lord said here. This is one of my favorite chapters in all of the scripture. But in John 14 in verse 1, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe ye also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And where I am, there ye may be also. My, my soul, man, you know, except in Jesus Christ, we have been given this promise right here and right there. If there was no other scriptures in all of the Word of God that we were to read, if we read those three verses there, we have the answer to our fear, which is based upon our relationship with the Father. 21 times in uh, the book of uh, uh, the John 14, 21 times the Father is mentioned. And that relationship is based in the connection with the Lord Jesus Christ in His blood. you got to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in order, number one, to receive the rescue. We need a rescue in our life. The latter part of verse 1 says, Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Friend, how often, ask yourself this question this morning, how often do you sit and worry about things that you have, now listen carefully, absolutely, positively, zero control over? We all do it, don't we? Every single one of us at some given point in time in our life, whether it was when we try to lay down at night and go to sleep, whether we're in a car on a long trip, whether we're in church, amen, whatever it may be, there are times that we worry about things that we have no control whatsoever. How many times have you registered your bank account in your mind today or next week, thinking about the bills that are going to go out before the income comes in? How many times, uh, guys, have, have you dreaded going to work tomorrow or had fear of no fuel being in your car to depart the house today? We face those things. We deal with those things in our life. We, they, they, they have a consuming concern to us in our hearts and our minds, and it robs us and it takes away what Christ is trying to give you. He's already prepared a place for you, mind. We'll get into that in just a moment. But you know what your heart needs this morning? What your heart needs today? It needs a rescue. And if you're worried about things that you have no control whatsoever over, you're not allowing the Lord to rescue. Our heart needs a rescue. And there is only one person who can provide such a delivery. It's not going to be your neighbor. It's not your friend. It's not your coworker. It's not even your spouse. But there's only one. Read this testimony that Paul gives, 2 Corinthians 12. Read it from the screen. 
He says, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations... There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, as three times, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. He goes on to say, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. What did the Lord open up John 14 with? Let not your heart be troubled. In all the world that we live in today and where we are, let not your heart be troubled. Trouble. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient enough to rescue your heart from the troubling thoughts that you have every single day of our life. But you must believe. You must believe. What did he say there in John 14? You believe in God, believe also in me. In order to have peace, in order to have that joy, in order to let certain things go. Now, guys, I mean, I'm talking about things that you have no control over, all right? But in order to have that peace, in order to have that rescue, you're going to have to believe. Too many people today trying to carry the load for the Lord Jesus Christ has stood there going, listen, I saved your soul. I, there's a place for you in eternity. And I want to give you joy on this earth. At, at the very least, I want to give you peace on this earth. Let me carry the load. You handle what you can handle, and I'll handle what you can't handle. That's the rescue, beloved. There is a rescue. Let not your heart be troubled. Number two, there is a residence. There, I don't know about you guys, but I think about that residence in heaven all the time. It, 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 it encapsulates my mind, my thoughts on a regular daily basis. In verse 2, he says in John 14, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Personal. For you. So what are you trusting in today? When, when, you, when you get into the middle of your day, in the middle of your life, in the middle of the, the road, the workplace, the home, whatever, what are you trusting today to have that peace in your life? Are you trusting in your talent? Are you trusting in your treasure? Are you trusting in your time? Jesus Christ said this in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 20. He says, But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. We spend so much time on the earth working for things which are simply going to perish. When we should exert as much, if not more, energy and effort in the things that's not in this world, that is in the world to come, in which the things of this world, in which the elements of this world cannot touch, treasures, if you will, in heaven. What do you, why, should, why do I say that? Because Jesus Christ says, Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. As a matter of fact, not only does he say, I go to prepare a place for you, he, he, he fills that on the back side. He gives a supporting statement saying, If it wasn't so, I'd tell you. You know, everybody believes in heaven. Most people, the majority of people in the world, even self-proclaimed atheists, believe that there is something beyond this life right here. I know they try to boast and say, well, you know, when we die, the lights are just out. They don't believe that. Not in the deepest and darkest elements of their life. And when they're put to the test on an A&E table, then none of them believe that it's just lights out, done and dusted, it's over with. Christ says we've got a residence. Christ says I'm going, in my father's house are many mansions. <clears throat> if it wasn't true, man, if it was not so, I would have told you, he says. So what makes you happy today? Do you look forward to that residence on the other side of this life? That residence, guys, where you don't have to clean, you don't have to cook. That residence, guys, where there's no pain, no, your back's not hurting, the bed's not lumpy, it's not too soft, not too hard. Uh, listen, that, that, that residence that's on the other side that was prepared by the creator of this world. Listen, if the one who created everything is preparing a place for you and I today, you know it's got to be nice. Amen. 
So where's your thoughts this morning? Where's your time and energy being exerted? What makes you happy? Uh, where, where are you in life today? Are you focused on what is beyond? Are you thinking about those times? Do you long for them and look for them? Or are you focused today to try to find happiness and peace in a place that's going to perish? Is your peace, your joy, your excitement in the things that are around you? Well, let me ask you this. What happens when they're gone? Let me ask you another question. If we were to go around the, the sanctuary this morning and take a survey of how many people have five friends, five, that they've known their entire life, no matter your age, five friends that are your close mates that you've known the last 40 years, 20 years, 30 years, 70 years, 80 years, whatever it may be. How many do you think could actually say yes? Now guys, when I say friends, I don't mean people you just send Christmas cards to. I mean people that you can call in a time of trouble. People that's got your back. You see, the reality is, guys, friends are going to come and go. Aren't they? Very few very few of us will maintain a dear friendship our entire life with someone because seasons change. People get married, they move away, they go here, they go there. They keep in touch with one another, I understand that. But those things change. To the saved, born-again believer today, that residence in heaven will never change. It only gets sweeter. It only gets closer in time. You see, my friend, if joy of those in the faith, again, it doesn't mean you can't have happiness in this world. We should have joy. We should have peace. But it shouldn't be found in the things that are temporal, at least not foundationally speaking. You know, the charismatics pride themselves after signs and healings. They robbed that from Israel, okay? Let me go ahead and make a blanket statement to everyone that's here this morning and listening online. They're faking it and they're liars. Number one, they ain't healing anyone, okay? Number two, they are not speaking in tongues. Number three, they ain't casting out any devils. They cast them, if they think they're casting out, it's just jumping on and in them. They are all deceived or deceiving others. Blanket statement. And I know that may rub some people wrong. And again, as Billy Sunday said, you always get, he got accused of rubbing the cat, stroking the cat backwards, tell the cat to turn around. You get your doctrine right, and it won't rub you wrong. Amen, preacher, right? Why am I saying that? Well, in the time when the spirits actually were subject to the disciples, in the time before Jesus Christ died, so the church was not founded yet, because it can't be founded until the death, burial, and resurrection, the establishment of the local New Testament church. In the time when signs and wonders were present in this world, which they are not today. Why? Because that which is perfect has come. There are no extra revelations. You have a perfect word of God in this AV right here. Anything else is demonic. And I'm, I'm making it very plain for you this morning, okay? Now, even in the time when devils were being cast out, when spiritual things were seen by people, in the time that Jesus Christ walked this earth, his disciples rocked back in, and they were saying, man, you want to, even the spirits were subject unto us. Man, we cast this one out, we told this one to go, and that one to go, and this one went, and they went over. Man, I'm telling you, and they were rejoicing in that. You know what Jesus Christ said to them? He said in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, notwithstanding in this, rejoice not. Now show a crazy maniac, a charismatic, show him this verse. That even in the time when it was known for these things to happen, Jesus said, don't rejoice in that. And they would have hoop and holler and dance like a bunch of demonic, slain in the spirit freaks, perverting the holy scriptures of the word of God. Jesus Christ said, notwithstanding in this, rejoice not. That the spirits are subject unto you. But watch this. 
but rather, he brings that attention back to that residence, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. We don't rejoice in the work that we do. We don't rejoice in, guys, listen, we have a residence in heaven that is brought back by a pure work that was started by Jesus Christ on this earth. A residence beyond these days, a residence beyond moth and dust and rust and thieves, a residence beyond what we see every single day, a residence that is eternal. Guys, when you lay your head down at night, you have an expectancy of seeing the Lord? Or do you have an emergency of His appearance? See, that's what we need to face today. As to whether or not we lay our head down at night and we say, Lord, I cannot wait to see you come. Or we lay, lay our head down at night and go, Oh, Lord, what if you come? That's where your pure work is established. Jesus Christ finished the work of salvation on the cross of Calvary. But then Jesus Christ commissioned his, er, his church. He commissioned the believers in his name. He commissions those that are saved and born again to perform a pure work through the gospel he has provided. So that they too may have residence in heaven. So that they too may have a rescue of their heart. Truth of the matter, guys, there will be, lastly this morning, there will be a return one day. Jesus Christ said in John 14 and in verse 3, he says, And if I go, and we know he did, and prepare a place for you, we know he is, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. This is, I, I, I've written down in my notes, I said, beloved, this is one of the greatest promises ever given. And I think i got to take a step back on my own notes. This is the greatest promise ever given. You know, let me, let me just sum it up. Jesus Christ says, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to prepare a place. How am I going to get there? I'm going to be abused. I'm going to die for your sins. I'm going to be punished for your sins. In my stripes, uh, you're going to be healed. Though your sins be as scarlet through my blood, through my death, through my resurrection, I will make them white as snow. And when I go, I'm going to start preparing a place for you. I'm going to build you a residence. And in the meantime, I'm going to rescue your heart from the worry you have in this life. He said, but I am coming back. Oh, I'm coming back. 1 Thessalonians 4 gives us that return. He said, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Paul goes on to say, then we who are alive or remain shall be caught up together in the clouds, and forever, he says, forever we will be with them. Some verses was used at Clive's funeral nine to ten years ago this November, December. You know why many people are not joyful in this life? You know why many Christians are not joyful in this life? I gotta say this the only people in this world today who have a right to have joy are the saved and born again, are the Christian today, those that know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I, I got news for you, man. If you have zero joy in your life, if you have no peace, no happiness, whatever, in your marriage, in your work, in your home, in your church, on the road, if you've got no joy whatsoever, your attention's on somewhere else. It ain't on the residence. you got your heart rescued, and you're not looking for the return of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean you're not going to have problems. It doesn't mean you're, going to have, you're not going to have sorrows. It doesn't mean you're not going to have dark days. But at the end of the day, through the darkness, through the shame, through the sorrow, through the depression, through all the things you deal with in this life, there's a return of Him coming back. And you should be looking forward to that. I remember in years past when my mom and dad would go on a holiday or something, and they'd leave me home by myself. And, and I knew when it was coming back, typically. Within a 24-hour window. And there was time, listen, if I had that house clean, 
which was rare probably. <laughs> but if I had that house clean, man, I'd just kick back on the, on the settee and watch the tell it. Be, it was all peaceful and joy. But if it wasn't, Dab, if there was a pile of dirty clothes and a pile of dirty dishes and, and rubbish all over the place, oh, man, my heart was... And I was looking at that door and every little twig of, the, of like when the wind would blow or something, I think, is them coming through the door. There wasn't no peace. There wasn't no joy. There wasn't no happiness in me sat there. No one, they're going to come back and I'm going to get a tail whooping probably. But if that house was ready, and that door unlocked, hey, mom and dad, how was your trip? It's no different with us. reason people have no joy in their lives is because they have nothing to look forward to. They don't have anything to see in themselves, no point, no rhyme, no reason, other than work, sleep, and play. Guys, we were created in this world to work. We were created to labor. We were saved and born again, now listen carefully, and left here on this planet to perform a pure work for the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason we don't have joy, so many of us in our life, is because we just, we just uh, wake, up, wake up, play, sleep, go to work, do what, we just do those things, and there's nothing we're laying down for eternity. And we know deep down inside our life, we know deep down inside of our heart, that there's a return. We're going to give an answer for not only what we've done, but what we haven't done. So, above what I'm asking you today in closing, are you performing a pure work? Do you have a rescue of your heart this morning? Do, do you have some unburdened, un, uh, unburdensome, if you will, sins in your life? Sins that are holding you back. Thoughts of, <coughs> of darkness, unhappiness because you're placing your faith and your attention on things that are eye level rather than getting them vertical. We struggle in our life. I mean, guys, struggling is part of life. I'm not going to say it's not. We have good days, we have bad days. The bad day is what makes good days so special. But nonetheless, we have days. And that's the blessing from on high. Every breath we take, every time that heart beats, every time you see, you see something with your eyes, every time you hear a sound. I used to love to hear the morning doves in the, in the morning time. I love to hear them sing. Such a sweet, sweet song that they make. Everything in this world is going to be temp- is temporal. And everything in this world is going to go away except for that which you lay upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, a pure work. Christ said, occupy till I come. We're banking today that he will have his return, and we believe that it's going to be soon. We have a promise, the greatest promise, that, hey, listen, I'm going to go, but I'm coming back. We're trusting today that while he's away, he is preparing a place, a residence for you and I. And we already know the end of the story according to Ephesians 1. We're sat in heavenly places with him right here, right now. So maybe you're here this morning, understanding your residency in heaven, understanding that he's returning one day. But maybe you're here this morning and you need a rescue of your heart. Maybe you need to evaluate where your affections are this morning. What are you worried about? Where's your thoughts today? Where's your thoughts in your marriage? Where's your thoughts in your workplace? Where's your thoughts in your everyday activities of this life? What are you so overly concerned with right here, right now, that is robbing you of the joy that Jesus Christ has for you today? He says, let not your heart be troubled. So, beloved, I'm here to say this this morning. If your heart is troubled today, it's by your own allowance. Most of what, most of things that are completely out of our control. And that which is in our control, we have been given a book on how to perform it properly. So if you're not performing the duties that you need to in your Christian life, let me, let me make a, a suggestion. Get busy. 
and do it right. So the things that you can't control, you don't have to worry about any longer. You give to him who can. That's a pure work this morning. Will you bow your heads? Father, we thank you, Lord, for the wonderful opportunity and time to be here today. We take, ask, and ask for you to take, Lord God, today the time that we've appropriated to you, this time this morning to come and hear your, your, your precious word. And I pray, dear God, that we would evaluate. Lord, let this not just be a tick box in our life. Let us not sit back and say, well, you can't teach an old dog new tricks and continue living the life that we are that's robbed of joy, that's absent of peace. Let us make changes, Father. Some here this morning may need to recommit to you, recommit to your local church. And Lord, I pray that if you're convicting souls right here, right now, and they choose not to do so, they choose not to answer, Lord, your call, I ask you to rob them of sleep until they do. Father, and help us, help us today make a difference in the world that you've given us. Help us, Father, put our faith and our trust in what you, what the Lord Jesus Christ said, and let our heart not be troubled. That he is coming back one day, that is a promise from on high. That there is a residence being prepared for us, and in the middle of all of those things, allow our heart to be rescued from the troubles that we deal with and the life that we live in. We ask these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.